Welcome to this opening plenary uh, uh, keynote at the Battle of Ideas. Who are we? Identity politics dissected. My name's Claire Fox and I'm the director of the Institute of Ideas. Um, I am really uh, pleased that we're discussing this issue and it's had something of an outing yesterday in some of the debates around cultural appropriation, which obviously and inevitably looked at this issue. But actually, I was uh, struck by how often the issue of identity came up in debates I was in uh, yesterday. People increasingly categorise themselves by race, gender, sexuality, religion and culture these days. And you'll know that phrase. I've just uh, written a short book called I Find That Offensive. And people will often say, as a black woman, I find that offensive. As a gay man, I find that offensive. As a Muslim, and that, I find that offensive. And that gives it extra weight. That kind of description of yourself in that kind of identity category uh, gives it some purchase. And I'm nervous about what this means, but it's undoubtedly a phenomenon. It's also the case that identity has always been something that people would want to understand themselves, search for meaning through who they are. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there's been broader categories uh, in the past, class, religion, uh, nationality, that seem to have less purchase today and more of these more individualised uh, identities have emerged. There's lots of tensions on this issue, particularly on university campuses, and people will have, or, or may be familiar with what happened to the novelist Lionel Shriver when she spoke in Australia and caused an international incident by wearing a sombrero um, uh, to illustrate her point. And she basically railed against identity politics. And that then uh, led to a big backlash against her. So whatever one thinks about it, it's certainly an, a, an area in which there's some dispute. And so it's really important that we try and get to grips and, and try and understand it. We actually looked at this issue last year in a kind of quite knockabout way, um, and it was a, a very enjoyable session, but it was always nagging at me that we didn't necessarily dig a bit deeper. So I've asked this panel to just reflect on that question in whatever way they want, and I know they'll all approach it from different perspectives. And so I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they speak. Now, just for the sake of those people who've never been at this festival before and weren't here yesterday either, the format for this session is that I've asked the panellists to speak for five to seven minutes, which is now and impossible to really dig as deep as I'd like them to. But nonetheless, they're going to give an intellectual provocation. And then we may have a little bit of time on the panel, but really they're kicking off a public conversation, which will then open up to you. And I'll take four or five points from the floor, then see if the panel wants to reflect on any of it, then go back out to the floor and so on. So it really is meant to be a, a, a discussion where we try and grasp, uh, grapple with this issue. So to introduce them in the order in which they speak, we've got uh, Dr. Julian Beghini at the end there, who's the founding editor of the Philosopher's Magazine, uh, has a PhD in philosophy of personal identity, co-author and editor of 20 books, including The Ego Trick, uh, Welcome to Every Town, Freedom Regained, The Edge of Reason. He's a battle regular. Later today, he's actually speaking in our academy in one day strand on what does Kierkegaard, um, what does Kierkegaard still matter? And he's doing a lecture on that, uh, which I'd highly recommend. And uh, he's always somebody who, when I read him, when I hear him speak, makes me think. I don't always agree with him, but I always come away having learned something. So can we give him a warm welcome, please? Thank you. We've then got uh, Sunda Katwala, who is the director of the independent think tank British Future. British Future's ambition is to inform and deepen the public conversation on issues around identity, immigration, integration and opportunity. And I think that when they set the think tank up, I wasn't sure if it would work, but I have to say that it's been very influential on... I read a lot of their stuff. I think they're doing some really useful work. And I, I, I follow uh, Sunder on... Um, uh, on Twitter, and I always find that he's a kind of really useful mediating voice on all of these kind of questions. So I'm delighted he's here. Previous General Secretary of the Fabian Society and was a, a leader writer at The Observer, but generally all round interesting guy. So can we give him a warm welcome, please? Uh, we have uh, sitting next to me uh, Michelle 
Moody Adams, who is currently the Joseph Straw Professor of Political Philosophy and Legal Theory at Columbia University, was the former Dean at Columbia College and Vice President for Undergraduate Education, has taught at Cornell University, where she was Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education, Wellesley College, the University of Rochester, and Indiana University. And she's published on topics such as equality and social justice, and moral psychology and the virtues of, and philosophical implications of race and gender. And is author of, um, uh, so God, I can't read this now, so I'm not going to say it. Right, she's very interesting. <laughs> no, what I was going to say. No, I'm not finished. <laughs> I just can't read her books. She can tell you that. Um, no, what I was going to say was, which is the most important bit, which was that um, um, uh, she shared a panel with uh, Professor Frank Friday in America, and he came back and said, oh, I've met this really interesting woman. You must try and get her to come. And I started to read some of the things that you'd written, and I was really impressed. And she's come a long way to be here, and I'm absolutely thrilled that you're here. So can we give her a warm up? Uh, then joined by Brendan O'Neill, uh, who's editor of Spiked, obviously one of the festival's media partners. Uh, Spiked magazine is, uh, says that it wants to make history as well as report it. Uh, Brendan is a columnist for The Big Issue, writes for The Spectator, was last year nominated for columnist of the year in the Press Publishing Awards. The Telegraph calls him one of Britain's sharpest social commentators, and The Guardian says that he's a sub Danny Dyer obnoxious intellectual wind up merchant. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure which one he's come as today. Uh, he's uh, uh, got collections of uh, his essays, A Duty to Offend. Obviously, he's uh, very well known in, in, in Britain and Australia, and more and more internationally, as somebody who tells it as it is. We're delighted to have him here, Brendan O'Neill. And last but not least, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome back Ivan Hewitt. Uh, Ivan has spoken um, many times on the cultural issues and on music at the festival. And I think in this debate, it's very important to have a cultural angle because it's partly uh, one, one of the ways that this, uh, um, uh, uh, the ideas around identity express themselves. Um, Ivan is a writer on music for the Daily Telegraph. He's a, been a broadca he's a broadcaster on BBC Radio 3. He's a teacher at the Royal College of Music. He's had a wide and varied career from helping to bring Jonathan Miller's uh, dramatisation of Back St Matthew Passion to the screen to being the presenter of BBC Three's weekly magazine show, Music Matters, where I actually met him when I was uh, on, a guest on the show, which is obviously a sign of the dumbing down of Radio 3. What was I doing <laughs> on that? But anyway, uh, he recently presented... Uh, Key Matters on, on Radio 4, and is the author of a fabulous book called Music, Healing the Rift. Can we give him a warm welcome, please? <laughs> so, Julian, uh, kick us off, please. Uh, thanks so much, Claire. Well, listen, in this session, obviously, we're, to a certain extent, going to be uh, questioning some of the understandings and uses of identity. Um, but because of that, I think it's important, from my point of view, to begin by acknowledging straight up that these things do matter. They are important. I, I, I would hope that no one is going to deny that. I think it's a simple matter of fact that your experience of the world, the way you're treated, the way you're responded to, does typically make a difference depending on your, your gender, your skin colour, whether you show any particular signs of a religious affiliation. And these things can change your experience in quite deep and profound ways. There's very strong and robust evidence for this. So, you know, I, I, no one, I think, is going to be claiming that identity doesn't matter at all. So wh why are we discussing it? Why are there problems? Well, I think there are perhaps three problems I can perhaps flag up just to begin with. I think the first one is that although it is, I think, silly to deny that identities are real and matter to people, it does become problematic when they become too essentialized. In other words, when people start thinking about you know, the, who they really are is defined in a kind of core and unshakable and central way by typically just one identity. So, and, and I think that there's been lots of very interesting writing on this by very thoughtful people. I mean, Amartya Sen's book, Identity and Violence, I think was very good on this, or perhaps a little long on it, but the, but the key point was, was right. It's that, you know, look, we all have any number of identities, uh, you know, we, 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 whatever we might be, male, graduate, man of Kent, whatever these things might be. And we have a huge number of these things. And first of all, you know, we're not simply defined by one 
uh, by itself. Maybe we're not even defined by all of them. Perhaps, you know, we are identities plus other things which don't fit necessarily into any particular identity. And, 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 but when people start to think about these identities in highly essentialized terms, I think that's where things get a little bit problematic. That's where you get divisions opening up. Because if you have an essentialized identity, it makes you essentially different from people whose identity is different on that score. So if, if I say, for example, identify myself as, a, as an atheist and I say that into essentialist terms, then you know it's me versus everyone else who believes in, in God and you have those distinct camps. So the essentializing tendency is wrong and it's not at all required. You know, someone can, can insist quite rightly that, for example, being a Muslim in Britain is an important part of their identity and raises political issues that need raising, without going down that route of entirely essentializing it and saying that is what defines them full stop. Now, a second interesting thing about identity, though, is that although there's this essentializing strand, there's also a kind of a tension between whether or not we think these identities are, as it were, given or, or whether they're chosen. And I think that's quite an interesting one, because I think a lot of the time, a lot of these identities, people think they're, they're just given. So a national identity, a lot of people, um, it, well, it's, it's different actually in, in, in other countries like North America and Canada, but in a lot of European countries, people who've grown up in a country believe that their Britishness is kind of built in, it's in their day, DNA, you know, Tony Hancock and his sort of like this pure Anglo-Saxon blood and everything. On the other hand, though, a lot of these identities are now seen, being seen very, very strongly as things that can be chosen. So you can even ch choose to be black, for example, even though, you know, in terms of your historical genetic inheritance and family upbringing and so forth, you know, you wouldn't be called black by any impartial judge, similarly around sexualities as well. Now here I just think there's, a, there's, a, there's just a simple tension. The fact of the matter is that identity has this dual aspect. Um, identity is not something which is, I mean, some identities perhaps are purely given, but on the whole, um, I, we, we neither have the complete freedom to choose any identity we want because we are constrained by things like our biology, our history, our culture, and so forth. At the same time, because the, going back to the essentialist point, it's, it's not the case that we have no room for freedom of choice at all. So the, the, the difficult aspect here is finding that, that middle ground in which we give due regard both to our capacity to auto-identities and the extent to which not everything is within our control. So these first two points together, I think, you know, the, the thing that adds up from them is that we, we have to see identities as being plural and to a certain extent fluid and malleable, but not infinitely malleable, not infinitely fluid. We have to negotiate that space between freedom and necessity, if you like, between our, our capacity to make our own choices for ourselves and the fact that we are all thrown into the world, created and brought up in cultures which shape us in ways that we did not choose ourselves. Um, final point I'd just like to bring up is the one worrying aspect, I think, that is alluded to in Claire's introduction, is that uh, these identities are often used to exclude uh, perspectives from people who don't belong to a particular group. So the idea here is that, you know, that I, I can't speak about any issues which are sort of women's rights issues, for example, because I am a man and I can't understand. Now, again, I think here, rather than sort of getting to a big ding-dong about, you know, for or against, it's again a question of an appropriate kind of moderate in-between point which understands the extent to it is true that, you know, unless you are a member of a certain group, unless you've had a certain social experience, you can't perhaps fully understand it in the way that other people do. And I think that's true. And I think we have to try hard to allow for that. And I think this idea, you know, check your privilege, which some people might mock as a slogan, I think there's a lot to that. As a sort of, you know, white man in, in Britain, I think I should be checking my privilege. But um, it, it, to go from that, so the kind of viewpoint where no one is allowed to speak on a, on, a, on a subject unless they're within that group. That is, again, it's like the essential thing. It's a recipe for division. It makes dialogue impossible. It makes mutual understanding impossible. And also it raises the danger of, well, then who speaks for those people in that group? 
Inadvertently, it ends up giving power to, you know, often self-elected spokespeople who claim to represent all people in this essentializing tradition. So I think, so in all these points, you can see that the, the, the broad approach I have is that, you know, it's not like we need to be for or against the assertion of identity and so forth, but we always have to be quite sensitive to make sure that we acknowledge what is real and, and solid and concrete in identities without making them so solid and concrete that they become rigid, inflexible, etc. Uh, thanks, Julian. A really useful start, I think, raises all of the kind of issues that I hope that we're going to look at. So, Sunder, your thoughts. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks thanks for inviting me to be here. I agree with most of uh, all the sensible things that um, Julian said, so I'll try and, I'll try and kick on and, and go somewhere else. Of course, um, identity is going to matter to people. It matters more, I think, in society and politics now. Maybe it matters more because the world's becoming more similar in some ways, and that's why it matters more. But, you know, should Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton be president? Should Scotland be independent or part of Britain? Should Britain have gone for Brexit or was it a mistake? These are quite big, important choices that we bring identity views to. And I think any view that says, oh, could people get over this identity, leave it at home, keep it out, you know, austerity matters, jobs and housing, why do we have to do this nonsense, or, or whatever it is, it's just, it's just missing the point that our politics is going to represent who we are and we're people to whom um, identity matters. I just want to think about some of the dilemmas for liberals uh, of, a, of a society when identity is important, high profile, and quite polarizing. What, what, do, what do liberals do with that sense of polarization? I think, it, I think it risks making people who are sort of liberal Democrats uh, wanting a sort of rationalist world too allergic to getting stuck in to the debates about identity that liberals themselves need to engage with. I understand why that, why that happens. It's, there's a feeling that the politics of identity is often represented by a particular type of populist, nativist argument about them and us, and you know, any country you go to, any debate you're having. Um, it boils down, I think, to some quite similar them and us claims. There are too many of them might be immigrants, it might be Muslims, it might be ethnic minorities, but there's too many of uh, somebody different. Um, they're taking our stuff, things that should be ours, might be jobs, might be housing, might be, you know, um, relationships, uh, women, uh, you know, they're taking our stuff. Um, uh, they're not like us and they don't want to be. We are not like them. They've come to where we live and they're still carrying on as if they're not living here now and um, often we're not allowed to talk about any of this or we get called racist and that's uh, that's entirely wrong and there's another group not the them in this case but the liberal elite that is shutting all of this down and saying it's all fine go away no you're not allowed to talk about this and I think um, I think because of that the power and potency of that sort of them and us polarization um, a lot of people who are liberal think you know eat, I don't really know I really could we not talk about this isn't there something else to do and that's a great mistake or start making arguments that actually don't work unless you're already strongly on the liberal don't really feel there's much going on here side um, such as um, are there that many of them really coming in you know didn't this all go back centuries or um, you know um, are people taking too much? Look, I've got some graphs and some studies. Maybe it all comes out in the wash. Maybe it's a good thing. Isn't our culture more diverse with difference? You know, the food is better in Britain because of immigration. Everyone will give you the food is better. But is the food is better now? Where would you be without your curry? Is that, is that, is that a big enough sort of way to respond to what's going on? And, uh, you know, a bit of... Um, not very comfortable with having this conversation. Can, can we move on? The interesting thing about those kinds of points, diversity is good for us, actually people pay in, people come for a long time. They are actually in their benign intention to sort of answer these points and not have a them and us uh, approach this. They are, they are all them and us claims. They are actually the claims that they are good for us. And a they are good for us benign version of them and us is still them and us, in my view. It isn't doing a more important thing of saying, who are we now? 
Where's the new us? How do we do that together? And that wouldn't be about, you know, checking the fiscal contribution of, you know, the Asian or black communities, because you wouldn't do that anymore, because that would be an odd thing to do. So I think, I think, I think firstly, liberals need to get to a sort of argument about us that works. This is difficult for two reasons. For identity, I think, is doing two things um, in a liberal society. It's allowing us to be autonomous and individualistic and sort of articulate the version that really works for us as individuals and as consumers in a marketplace, we get to do that, we get to be individuals. But politics is about something else. Politics is about the collective choices you make in a liberal, diverse society. So sometimes just saying, well, this is how it feels to me, isn't enough. I think we've got certain types of identity politics that are kind of playing to let's pick a tribe if it's very fragmented. You know, UKIP is a particular tribe for people who don't like things that have happened in the last 30 or 40 years. And then after the referendum, suddenly a sense the boots on the other foot. If you want to, you can join cosmopolitan UKIP. Give us our country back. Where are the Liberal Democrats and the Greens? Let's, you know, let, let's, let's have a sort of thing that works for us. And I think there's a great value in a democracy of being torn actually, in terms of trying to find the common ground between these statements. But I think this is difficult for people who are liberal because there's a sense that, you know, do you polarise or depolarise is the question I'm asking. And I'm saying it's good to depolarise, even though these are important questions, and people are worried about depolarising because they might be giving up their values. Yet, open, let's be open, not closed, is a very polarising way, in my view, to sort of say, you've all got it wrong, you want closed, we want open. It doesn't really try to do anything about uh, having the common ground. It risks saying to me, I think, that London and the university cities do want to be little cosmopolitan outposts that want to live on a different country to say, you know, to their friends abroad, um, you know, don't worry, we're still with you, don't know what all these other idiots are doing, but we're still there, and they should be doing exactly the opposite. Actually, they should be trying to embed themselves much more in the society they're part of in order to win the argument for openness with most people, to spread the gains of openness. For me, the British referendum was about the distance, not from London to everywhere else, it was about the distance from Manchester to Wigan and from Newcastle to Hartlepool and from Exeter to the South West. And I think from those kinds of places, you could do more work, actually, to connect up, to depolarise these debates. So I think that's what we need to do. And this takes us to the point, I think, that Julian raised about check your privilege and does that work. That, that sort of thing, I'm very um, n not comfortable with that kind of check your privilege um, sort of stuff. But actually, my story of self explains to me why I, why I don't really like that. I'm mixed race. My dad was born in... India, my mum was born in Ireland, grew up in the north of England, moved to the south of England. When someone says, oh, we'll have a community of communities, multiculturalism, it won't work, actually, for someone with my story of self, because I haven't got a tribe. It helped me if other people want to be outside their tribe as well. But Check Your Privilege is doing another thing that is missing the point, which is that we need to negotiate the answer to these questions. So a view of racism that white people thought, well, that's pretty fair, that's what racism is, and black people didn't recognise it at all, that wouldn't be a very good view of racism, but nor would it be helpful to have a politics of racism or anti-Semitism that the minority group recognise a claim and the majority group don't understand what they're saying. You have to negotiate the shared social norms. I want shared social norms against prejudice. It turned out that sort of shouting things I used to hear at Everton Football Club, you know, um, if Arsenal had black players, you know, turned out to be a shared social norm we could get rid of. You know, people shouting, shoot that nigger at footballers who are 20, you know, you got rid of people being able to do that, and that was a, a norm. You had to negotiate that. Gender relations are negotiated by women and men. I mean, clearly the group involved, you know, that has the ownership of it has a particular authenticity of one kind, but there has to be a negotiation of that. My only experience of um, cultural appropriation, apart from when it's occasionally discussed at <laughs> debates like this, is being told on Twitter, I can't call myself English. And that seems to me, you know, a ridiculous claim uh, and therefore I'm you know I'm against all of the kinds of claims of that kind that are made and I don't want other people to legitimize them so I think I think we have to negotiate this on the grounds that people will bring their identity to the table um, and then we've got to make social choices about what identity we want to share thanks Brilliant. Great, so that's brought all sorts of uh, interesting new ideas onto the table. So now, Michelle, please. Thanks so much, Claire. I'm delighted to be here also. So my comments are actually, I think, a nice follow-on to the previous two sets of comments, because I want to start with the distinction between a kind of constricting, essentializing identity politics, which I think we're entirely right to reject. 
I see it go on too often. I, and as an administrator in a, in a university setting, I see students who get wrapped up in thinking that's what real politics is, and it isn't. There is a different kind of identity politics, however, and I call it revitalizing identity politics. Uh, it's probably not so distant um, from what Sundar was, was talking about. And I think that, in fact, democracy is impossible without this kind of revitalizing identity politics. It, we're obviously in a political setting right to expect people to sometimes want to put the, the things that distinguish them from the whole aside and to establish commonalities with others to think of themselves as citizens. But sometimes, democratic majorities get things wrong. They get them wrong in all sorts of ways. They get them wrong in the kind of practices they defend, in the referenda they do or don't vote on, in the people they elect to high office in some contexts. And we have to assume that sometimes it's only because some people are willing to stand apart from the majority on the basis of some distinguishing aspect of their identity, whether it's their religious objection to slavery, so the origins of 19th century abolitionism depended on the willingness of some people to stand apart, whether it is the um, rejection of uh, Jim Crow segregation in the American context, which depended upon the willingness of some people to stand apart on the basis of their identity. I could give any number of other examples. I could talk about the history of the women's movement. But we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. If we give up the essentializing kind of identity politics, that doesn't mean that no identity politics is valuable. I want to say one thing to the identity politics group, however, to the crowd that, that wants to remind us of how important it is. If we are going to engage in it, we have to do it in a way that's reflective, critically reflective, and that mostly opens out onto the possibility of reconciliation after the political struggle has been resolved, or at least partially resolved. There's one way to do it that's defended by somebody like Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi that involves reconciliation being possible because you undertook your challenge in a nonviolent way. But I cite also Nelson Mandela, who obviously at one point in his life relied upon violence, but who understood the importance of reconciliation, of forgiveness as critical to reestablishing something like democratic solidarity in South Africa. And the second thing I would say to the, uh, to the person engaging in revitalizing identity politics, suffering is not intrinsically ennobling. If somebody offends you or wounds you, and I actually think that sometimes what people dismiss if, as offense really is in fact a kind of wound, and I call it, like many people in the legal community, expressive harm. But if your suffering does not in itself ennoble you, and there are also distinctions between different kinds of suffering. Somebody calling you the wrong name or forgetting that you happen to be in the room is not the same thing as somebody making it impossible for you to get a job because they've stigmatized what it is to be, to be a person of, of color in a certain setting. And I would also add that the personal, whatever the slogan said, the personal is not intrinsically political, something constructive and transformative has to be done to make it political. And I think the danger is some kinds of identity politics think simply saying I'm black and you didn't listen, that's not enough, that's not politics. But finally, to the person who wants to dismiss identity politics, even the essentializing kind, do not forget that it's all too easy to say that the person on the other side who says you've caused me some kind of harm because you've ignored some important fact about my identity or you've stigmatized me in some way, don't forget that there have been moments in human history where people were told, oh, you just put that construction on what I said. I'm not really stigmatizing you. That was said, believe it or not, in a Supreme Court case in the US in 1896, a case called Plessy versus Ferguson, in which segregation on railway accommodations, amongst other things, was declared not to be a stigma. That's just those black people putting that construction on it. And the danger is we never know which reaction that's coming from the person who says that you have failed to treat their identity seriously. We never know which reaction may be the one that we, in the majority, need to be most attentive to. We are discomfited by it, we're upset by it, but maybe this is the next 
kind of um, uh, response uh, to, uh, to expressive harm that actually is a sign that something's wrong in our society. It took 60 years in the US. It took Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, and then another 10 years, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, for the fact of stigma being a genuine harm to be recognized. And so I caution anybody who thinks that you should just dismiss identity politics as, oh, we're tired and they make us feel bad. Sometimes democratic majorities need to feel bad. And I think history offers many important lessons of that sort. Thank you. Right, some, some very useful uh, uh, kind of prongs in the side of the issue there that I really want to explore as well. Um, so, uh, Brendan, your thoughts, please. Thank you. Um, I was reading recently about a new gender identity. Gender identities are invented every week, pretty much. And there's a new one called aerogender, which shouldn't be confused with aerosexual. Aerosexual are people who are turned on by aeroplanes. Uh, this... But aero, which sounds perfectly sensible in comparison to what aerogender is. Aerogender is someone whose gender changes depending on their surroundings. So this is a person who can be a man one minute and a woman the next minute. You know, like, for example, a man who walks into a woman's changing rooms instantly becomes a woman and identifies as a woman. You know, very conveniently, he, the world moulds itself around his or her identity. And I thought... I had two, thing, two thoughts when I was reading about this uh, era gender, this changeable gender identity. The first is just how insane it is. You know, you, you, you should never, you should always try not to pathologize social phenomenon. Uh, that's a bad thing to do, generally speaking. But you do sometimes wonder if these people are slightly unhinged. You know, it's the split personality thing and they're describing it as an identity. It is a bit crazy. And my second thought was a more serious one, which is, what I think that really speaks to, this idea that your, gender, your whole gender could change so quickly depending on the room you walk into, what I think that really speaks to is how fragile and hollow and changeable identity is today, literally changeable. It can change at the drop of a hat. And I think that tells us something very important about the politics of identity now. We have this tendency to think, because the politics of identity is increasingly the only game in town and everyone has to play it, we have this tendency to think it's very strong. It's on the march. You know, the identitarians are marching through the institutions and forcing everyone to buy into their identity claptrap often. But actually, I think the new politics of identity is built on the collapse of real identity and the weakness of people's sense of themselves. And I think that's the kind of era that we're living in. I just want to touch on two things quickly. Firstly, the question of where this new identity politics comes from. And secondly, the question of what we lose as a result of it. So on the question of where it comes from, I think it's fundamentally the corrosion of public life, the corrosion of, of national life, which gives rise to this, this new desperate attempt to create new identities, often from nothing, often just utterly invented after reading a blog post and thinking, oh, I feel like that too. Uh, you know, it's the demise of the institutions and the ways of life through which people once derived a sense of themselves. It's that which underpins the new kind of scrabble for a new identity. You know, the, the fall of churches and their influence, of trade unions, of old politics, even of the idea of the nation, which is a very unfashionable idea these days. And as we know, national identity is also in great crisis. The fall of all those institutions, the crisis of all those institutions, means people find it very difficult to know who they are or what they are or what their sense of self is. And that gives rise to this kind of frenetic search for an identity where you patch all these different feelings together and say, whoa, this is who I am. And so what happens is that identity becomes this very insecure phenomenon, very shaky, very insecure, very fluid, uh, which is why you get terms like gender fluid, which you, know, you, you might think is a fancy term for incontinence or something, but gender fluid is where your gender changes all the time. Um, and I think that idea of fluidity really speaks to the, the weakness of identity, how unanchored it is in any of the ways of life and, and institutions people might once have defined themselves through. And you can really see that in the rise of the term, I identify as, uh, which, I, which I find a very fascinating term. You know, in the past, people said, I am. I am a Catholic. I am Irish, I am whatever. Obviously, I'm talking about myself, self-obsessed. Uh, you, you were something, I am. It was a declaration, it was confident. 
you were certain you knew what you were. Now you say, I identify as, which basically means, I think I'm this thing, mm, I'm not sure, and maybe I won't be this thing tomorrow. It's a very contingent, weak phrase, and it suggests that this stuff can change because you don't really know what you are. You just identify as something because you have a certain feeling. And that changeability was really captured. I read a piece recently about this man slash woman whose identity changes on a daily basis. So one day he is Lauren, and the next day he is Larry, depending, literally depending on what he feels like in the morning. And of course, everyone has to indulge this fantasy. And everyone has to refer to him as he or she, depending on his feeling, which uh, uh, otherwise you are transphobic. And I think it's the weakness of identity politics, which is why it is so intolerant often. That's why on campuses in particular, you're not allowed to criticize certain aspects of transgenderism, for example. That's why the new identity politics is so desperate for validation. They will literally corner you and say, do you accept my identity? And if you don't, you're a racist or a transphobic or a misogynist or whatever else. They need that validation because the new politics of identity is actually profoundly needy and desperate, is constantly seeking approval precisely because it's so weak. And I think that's a very striking thing. Then finally, uh, the question of what is lost as a consequence of the rise of this politics of identity, I think something incredibly important, which is the possibility of any kind of humanist politics whatsoever. That's really what's lost, because what identity, the new identity politics calls into question is the capacity of humankind to move beyond biological categories, to move beyond race, to move beyond gender and sex and all those other things, uh, except um, where you play with those in, an, in a childish, fluid way. What it also uh, contributes is this a very essentializing process where you are defined by uh, your individual identity, your sexual preferences, your race, and so on. And it really calls into question the whole idea that drove the progressive movement for years and years and years, which was that people should be judged by their character, not their color, in, in essence. That, saying that on some American campuses is now considered a racial microaggression. Uh, say, quoting Martin Luther King is now considered a racial microaggression because it denies people's racial experiences. So what we have is this extremely fragmenting process where people constantly distinguish themselves from others. The new identity politics invites you to constantly distinguish yourself from others, and it's a very separatist idea. And I think, actually, the idea of checking your privilege, checking your white male privilege, is part of this process of self-distinction. That's really about largely middle-class white men distinguishing themselves from other white men who aren't as switched on and racially aware. So even that has that real... <laughs> Uh, process of self-distinction. Um, so my final point would be simply that the problem with this identity politics is that it speaks to the corrosion of all the good things that we might once have defined ourselves through. It makes solidarity and humanist politics utterly impossible. And the way to address this problem of identity politics is not to take the piss out of it, which is really good fun, I know, but is actually to repair public life, because it's the collapse of public life that has nurtured this new politics. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Brendan. I think that the, there's a, a, a Canadian professor, uh, Graham Good, who, who described it as the new sectarianism, and I think you talked to some of the ways that identity politics can be quite a divisive thing in the contemporary discussion. So we'll come back on some of those points. But now, finally, Ivan, your thoughts. Thank you. As somebody's already mentioned, um, this topic of cultural appropriation is very intimately connected with this one. And... Uh, of course, I come to this uh, with a uh, slightly peculiar perspective of someone who's, who loves and is supposedly an expert in a form of art, form of music, which is culturally appropriate par excellence, you know? There has been no form of music making, probably, which has hoovered up uh, music's foreign or alien to itself with such avidity and appetite as Western classical music. It seems, I know it's a curious topic to maybe to raise in this context, but I think it's quite revealing in a way because I think in a, in a strange way, th this, this particular artistic practice uh, is a rather sort of beautiful cultural mirror of, of liberal politics at its best, in a way, in the sense that it, it offers a space of negotiation for many different practices to enter and enter into a sort of mutually illuminating dialogue. I mean, it's often felt that um, 
cultural appropriation is always a one-way thing, you know, that, that it's all, it is always the dominant culture reaching out and seizing on things which uh, offer it a sort of blood transfusion at a moment when it's becoming a bit tired. Uh, it's a kind of theft, really, uh, and totally illegitimate. But um, it's worth remembering that, that the Western classical tradition has itself become the subject of eager appropriation. I mean, it's, it's forgotten sometimes that uh, during the time of slavery, uh, in places like um, New Orleans, slaves were avid watchers of opera. They would go to the opera house. Um, admittedly, they had to stay downstairs in the, in the stalls, which were the, you know, the, well, the, the white knobs were up in the gallery. But they loved what they heard, and it, it left a profound mark on jazz. Um, some of the early jazz musicians, like King Oliver, could play long stretches of French opera by heart. It was extraordinary. Um, and Wynton Marsalis uh, is, is adamant on the fact that, that uh, jazz has two parents, one of which is classical music. Isn't that extraordinary? Um, my feeling is that, um, that, that, that the, the, like liberal politics, classical music has its door open always to strangers. <coughs> I remember, my, my, just to digress for a moment, my first encounter with uh, real politics was precisely that. It was walking past an open door as a student. Uh, I, I was... Um, uh, I was on my way to a meeting and I passed an open door and I could hear this, agi this buzz of excited conversation from inside. I thought, wow, that, that's interesting. Um, actually, it was a Lib Dem meeting, so maybe it wasn't that. It, it, maybe it wasn't so interesting, but, but nevertheless, it, it stopped me in my tracks, you know, and I, I sort of I, I spent half an hour there. And uh, it was extraordinary. For a minute, I became a self-chosen member of this little community. And what bothers me, I suppose, about uh, something uh, about the, the whole notion of identity politics is what, what doors within it are open for, for strangers to enter? When does it ever offer a welcome to someone who's not a member of that group already? And I, I would simply point to, to cultural practices um, of the West as having developed a particular set of, I, I refer particularly to classical music here, as having developed a set of Institutional, an institutional framework which allows for meetings, uh, a shared discourse, uh, which is open to the world and is liable to be overturned at any minute um, and, and changed in, in extraordinary ways because it has no essence. Somebody mentioned the danger of essentialism earlier. And the, the wonderful thing about the music that I deal in is it has no essence. It, it's, one cannot point to a part of it and say, that's the heart of it. Because the heart of it, in a sense, is is a kind of negotiation, a set of techniques which, which can always be changed. And so uh, I would, I, I suppose my, my parting thought would be, would be um, that let, let, us, let us keep cultural practices in mind as a space for, for negotiation which can perhaps enlighten and, and rejuvenate uh, our politics and, and remind us that, that doors have to be kept open. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Avan. I, I love that idea of the, the keeping the door open. Um, Julian, I'm, I'm just, just because it's been a while since we've heard from you, I'm just going to ask a couple of, of, of you questions before going out to the audience. So be warned, audience, I'm coming out to you. Um, but Julian, just in terms of like uh, some of the things that you were saying at the beginning, I, and I know because you, you were interested in this, one of the things that I've noticed is that the previous categories of, people, of, of, of things like class and so on, they themselves have now started to compete in the identity politics market. I mean, do you know what I mean? People will now say, um, um, what about working class boys, for example? And then, and then suddenly they become, a category, they become an identity group and you've got to kind of like deal with them as a group. But have you noticed that, that there's a kind of fracturing into everyone is now competing for a bit of this? Or do you think that's overstating it? Or is there anything you want to reflect on what you've heard? Well, um, actually, I should say something about um, uh, checking privilege because a couple of uh, oh, people right. mentioned it. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm, I, I can see. I can see. There's a certain way of doing it which would be wrong and divisive and everything. But I, I think I mean something quite modest. But I think it's just having some kind of sense of awareness that you know other people may not be being given the same privilege as you, and just be aware of it. It's not a huge thing. And I, I think Brendan's um, comment was 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 quite funny. But I think. Um, 
which is completely unfair because the fact of the matter is there's this sort of idea that people are virtue signalling means that it becomes impossible to do anything in an open way for an ethical reason because then you just get accused of doing it just to signal how ethical you're being. So a vegetarian, you know, oh, it's not because you really care about the welfare of meat, you're just trying to show how superior you are to those people who do eat meat. So, yeah, some people, I'm sure, do do this check their privilege thing as a way of distinguishing themselves, but it's certainly not an essential part of it. But going back to your point, Claire, I mean, I think it's true, but I think, I think that this is where it gets tricky, though. I mean, you, you have to, you know, politics, um, when you're looking at how to create a fair and just society, you, you can't go around counting everybody individually. You have to sort of do a certain amount of uh, looking at people in groups in order to see whether uh, um, policies are working fairly. So you, you're kind of forced at times to consider white working class boys, for example, or, you know, people in former industrial towns and villages and so forth. So I think the use of these groupings isn't problematic. It only becomes problematic when, as seems to be too often is the case, it ends up becoming the, the, the key, key definer of it. You know, I would hope, you know, white working class boy um, should not be defined... <laughs> in that way completely. But at the same time, it's totally appropriate that government needs to recognise that people who share that similarity are also sharing a certain similar set of problems and looking at how policy can address it. So in other words, it's, it's like these categories have to be used as, you know, heuristics. They're means to an end. It's only when they sort of end up becoming so rigid that they define people in unchangeable ways that it becomes problematic, I think. Uh, yeah, so uh, Brendan and, Mich and, and Sunder, what about Michelle's point? I'm not saying that either of you would disagree with it, but how does that fit in? Which is, that, you know, one of the difficulties is that sometimes minorities who represent groups want to say, you know, we're going to fight, both, either of you, both of you, I'm, I'm saying, yeah. want to fight slavery, you know, and, and then, then people say, oh, it's just those black people making a fuss. I mean, we're not discriminating, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's what they said, right? But <laughs> well, we know, so that's the thing is, we can... We know that that can happen. We know that people can call racism or homophobia at the drop of a hat today. But then what do we do about the fact that sometimes there's racism or homophobia? You know what I mean? How do you yeah, deal with that? A, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, it's a good dilemma. It's important to think about it. I mean, if it wants to succeed, of course, and it has different roots, uh, including, you know, accept separation entirely and go and do your own thing, eventually to win the minority claim has to win majority consent. So it gets to negotiate those boundaries and I think I think you get a culture war I don't think we're interested in culture wars in this country and we have polarization I think America feels more culturally polarized you get a culture war when people don't think the overarching thing they're doing together is as important as the disagreement and that could be over something you know you know very symbolic so if, if take the confederate flag or something uh, in the American South if one group just thinks this is our heritage and this is our identity and another group thinks well that is just offensive that you're flying and they cannot now have a conversation where they negotiate what happens to that then they are accepting that that will always be polarized if they find a way through that and I think we've got shifts in race norms gender norms by having that negotiation but so it's uh, and the you know the ways of the ways from the, the minority position not winning the allies it needs and the ways of you know being two things if it gets too much into competing grievances it's bad but take the white working class boy um who's got less chance of going to university i think our government should care about white working class boys having less chance of going to university you've now got a situation in this country where ethnic minorities are a bit more likely to be university graduates than the rest of the population and it's probably the first country that's happened yet those ethnic minority kids who get to be graduates um are less likely to get the interview with the law firm when they send the cv and now we could have a politics of competing grievances do you care about the white working class boys who don't get you know to get to university or the uh, asian kid that doesn't get the interview but they could be the same they could be the same issue mm. and if you're entirely allergic to the category our friends in france will never look at the data because they because it would be unrepublican they don't have a more equal or more opportunity society because they won't collect the data very quickly, one of the things I did try to say is that there is a danger in a certain kind of identity politics, which I want no part of, which seems to believe that the personal, just because it is the personal, and because maybe I'm telling you something about some personal suffering you've caused me by not treating me you know, with sufficient, uh, 
seriousness. The personal is not intrinsically political. And there are people who think simply by hitting you over the head with the fact that you didn't recognize their special identity, that constitutes a political act. To me, it doesn't. And the lesson, you rightly mentioned people who don't want to hear about the stories of people like Martin Luther King. This was somebody who took care to transform the importance of recognizing this, the distinctiveness of the African-American experience of stigma and tried to find a way not just to transform it into the political, but to create commonality with communities that did not include only African-Americans. That's the reconciliation part that I mentioned. So I'm not here to celebrate oh, no, no, people no. banging you over the head with their identity. I have no interest in that. I tell students that, get over that. Do the really political thing, the self-absorption of, oh, he didn't get my identity right. That's, you know, it's an interesting fact, but it doesn't create political change. And that, maybe that makes me old-fashioned. I'll, I'll confess it, but I'm not interested in the other. Uh, just on the, the class question, class is not an identity. Class is a social condition. It's a social category. And the whole point of class politics, tradition, class politics traditionally is that class could be transcended. You could end the working class. The aim of work, radical working class politics was to get rid of the working class so that that category would no longer exist. Now what you have, as Claire says, is the ossification of class as just another fixed identity. You're born working class, you're a working class person, you'll stay working class so we have to help you. It's really backward and I think that really speaks to actually the elephant in the room in this discussion which is the end of class politics. And what the left did in response to the end of class politics was not say let's sit down and talk about how this happened and what we should do about it, but they added this kind of lick of paint on it, say, oh, now we have identity politics and it's wonderful. So we're not just interested in class, we're interested in gay politics and women's politics and black politics and it was the thing that replaced class politics and we at least should be honest about that. I still think class is an important thing. Politically, it doesn't have much clout, but it's still an important fact that uh, is still, I think, the most important experience. So, for example, a black working class person who spends uh, nine hours a day on a building site has far more in common with his white workers on that building site than he does with black academics or black writers or, bl or, or black lead student leaders who claim to speak on behalf of all black people. There are differences here which, uh, which are incredibly important. I think uh, the, the thing that really worries me about the identity thing is just this continual fragmentation. It's fragmenting more and more all the time. So actually you don't just have something anymore like the gay identity. Even that fragments. So now being a, a white middle class gay man is almost as bad as being a straight man. It's like, oh, you can't speak for black gays or, or lesbians from uh, the north of England or whatever else. So even within those identity groups, it fragments and fragments all the time so that you just get these tiny little sects, which is really dangerous. Uh, Ivan. I'm, I'm, I'm struck by the connection between this topic and uh, a, a general uh, uneasiness these days about the reality of human agency. Um, you know, we, we are trapped in determinisms of all kind. You know, we're, we're, we're constantly told by neurobiologists that, you know, it's the firing of our synapses that makes our decisions, not us as, as agents. And um, it's uh, the, the bothersome thing for me about identity politics is that, is that un, uh, underlying the, the constant fretting about who am I is the evacuation of the very thing that makes I interesting and valuable, which is the possibility to say, I believe this, I'm going to take this. For, I'm going to take this course of action, and it's 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 so it's the evacu it's the evacuating of of the of the discourse of, of the ethical element. And I, I was slightly puzzled, Michelle, by something you said about the abolitionist movement, which I think you said grew out of certain 19th century religious I do frameworks. Understand. But I, I, maybe I misunderstood. I, I almost got the sense that you were saying that that was a rather fine manifestation of identity politics because it was, came out of the group of 19th century religious co-religionists. Co Whereas to, to, me, it, to me, it's the extraordinarily courageous actions of a few brave people who want to stand against the, the consensus. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ethical position rather than, a, rather than saying, I belong to this religious group. I can't. Is that, is that, is that right? Yeah, no, no, Michelle. Yeah. Michelle wants to come back on a couple of things. You, yeah, very back. quickly. Why can't belonging to a certain group and having an ethical motivation also be a, a, a manifestation of identity politics? That's part of who they were, and it was important for them to express that and manifest that in the world. I also want to say though, very two things very quickly. One of them, it is clear to me 
that the difference between the American context and the British context really is relevant here. We've never really had class politics in the U.S., even though sometimes it, it came in, for instance, in the late in the, in the 1930s with the New Deal and so forth. Um, some ideas were sort of taken up into the mainstream. And racial politics in America sometimes is a sort of stand-in for class. Not always. As you point out, in the British context, it might be the case that um, a, a black construction worker has more in common uh, with a non-black construction worker than with a black academic. But I think one thing, the Black Lives Matter movement, I'm not always in favor of everything they say, but when I walk, I'm a professor. If I walk into a store, I'm as likely to be followed by the security guard who would follow the um, working class uh, black shopper um, as, you know, I'm as likely to be followed, and my white colleague would not be. So race turns out in the U.S. to be a much greater marker of what your experience will be like than it apparently is here. Um, okay, so um, lo loads to talk about. I, d I want to talk about the cultural appropriation issues as well, and anything you want to raise. Hello. So, um, first of all, I believe in inclusion, and I'm against division, and I don't like intolerance, so I believe in what Michelle has described as good identity politics. Um, however, sometimes the default of this sort of attitude sometimes is ignoring what makes us different. And... I mean, I think that was seen in media after the Orlando shootings, you know, Owen Jones was in, in, the, in the Sky News trying to speak out about how, you know, this was partly a homophobic attack. And, you know, I think, um, I think what, Owen, what Owen Jones was trying to say was just that, you know, you have to analyze the problems with, with this and what actually caused this attack, you know, and acknowledge that it was partly a had, it had to do with homophobia. It, was, it also had to do with jih jihadism and a lot of other factors. But you know, ignoring what makes us different is not really understanding diversity. I think understanding diversity is about acknowledging what makes us different and being okay with it. Um, so for example, when you talk about, um, yeah, I obviously think that a white person is, is, it can speak about you know, black um, rights. But I do take issue, though, in... Um, I think it would be a lot more productive if, if a discussion about black um, rights includes also black people, you know. So a discussion that exclu about, about black rights that excludes black people, I, think, I don't think is very productive either. Um, finally, taking on Brendan's point about volatile identities. Um, I mean, I... I mean, I don't really understand what the problem is with that. So, is it, like, I think people have the right to reinvent themselves as many times as they want. It's almost like saying you only get one shot at life to define yourself, you know. I don't think the problem lies there. I think, I think people should identify themselves, themselves with whoever they want and whatever they want. I think the problem lies in what Michelle has mentioned, which is dangerous identity politics and uh, identity politics that promotes exclusion. That comment's reminded me that what the panel has said up here actually does go against the grain of what is being argued broadly in society. Anyone who disagrees, do you've got to stand up and say that. I think the Orlando shooting was a, um, a massacre was a, a good example of where you saw a lot of tensions because I thought there was a bit of an, a, a, an unsavoury competition to kind of stamp it as a kind of anti-gay shooting. No, it's ours, it's ours. Right, no, I'm just saying, so, but it at least illustrates that there was a lot of tension around that kind of issue. So that, thank you for raising that, very interesting. So, I mean, I, I guess it's on a kind of similar topic in a way. It, it, it feels a bit like the discussion's getting a, a bit muddled between a good identity and I, I think as various people on the panel have said, you know, nobody would really disagree that identity is an important aspect of people's existence and has uh, you know, played an important part in, in, in different progressive movements. But that seems to me different to um, identity politics. And I, and I wonder whether the kind of key things is uh, about the relationship to authority that um, is encapsulated in identity politics. So um, in the, uh, there was a discussion yesterday about young people and mental health. And a couple of young people got up in the audience um, and were basically demanding that the NHS recognize their identity. Um, and it, and, it, and it kind of, obviously, in a public discussion, it's impossible to question that. You know, it's you know, it, mental health obviously is completely invisible um, in most cases. And it and it kind of feels that, um, as Brendan said, that one of the key things is uh, 
it becomes quite corrosive on any kind of potential for solidarity and it, it, it does it almost feels like a kind of social acid you know it kind of rots potential bonds between people because rather than um trying to uh build links identity if you like identity links with other people or kind of common interests with other people it becomes a very in individuated relationship to authority whether kind of directly to the state or, or other kinds of um sort of establishment institutions uh, well fantastic uh discussion and really provocative i mean uh, i suppose i have a question because um julian says the question is how to create a fair and just society and i think that's a really good question and a maxim but that involves the notion of justice and fairness which needs rigorous discussion and ideas and some sense of a universal principle and the problem i think with the discussion about identity which is usually far less sophisticated than it has been here today is that it, it puts us into echo chambers that reinforce our own notions and positions it's a bit like trying to learn a concerto without actually learning the form of music and playing the instrument. If you don't have the ability to uh, argue about a principle of justice for all, then, and you're caught up with wanting to be recognized for your identity, and that's not to trivialize an identity, but it's to recognize politically the role it has. If you constantly want recognition, rather than transcendence and transformation, that's a problem. As it happens, the idea of the universal man or universal person, the Renaissance idea that, you know, of the every man, that you could be many different things, right? It's something I think we can all aspire to, to transcend all of these identities. The problem is, if we're all competing to be recognized, albeit with the idea that we want to challenge oppression or whatever it might be for the just society, then we're not going to actually achieve what we want and we're going backwards, not forwards together. So on the uh, subject of identity, and particularly national identity, uh, I believe it was Kaiser Wilhelm II who said uh, on the outbreak of World War I to the Reichstag, something along the lines of, um, forgive me, I don't know the exact quote, I see no conservatives and socialists, only Germans. Uh, the First World War being a event that not only in Germany, across the whole of Europe, uh, brought together everyone in the respective societies towards a common goal. So my question to the panel is, do they think that in uh, modern day the uh, UK, given the deep social divisions, uh, there could be a unifying factor or any kind of event that, considering the uh, fragmentation of our society, would be able to bring everyone towards a common goal or is society these days simply too uh, atomized? My first question is to Julian. You said identity is important because it determines your world experience. Yes, this is true, but do you, do you not think to accept this as permanent is to accept discrimination based on identity, which is exactly what we're trying to eliminate from society and promote, as Brendan put it, humanist politics instead? But to Brendan, I agree with your assessment, but not your solution. I don't think the way forward is to repair the old ways of life because they collapse for a reason. Surely we should put up new institutions instead. Thanks to Claire, finally, for, we've, got, we've got to a panel discussion about identity politics, which I've been pressing to do for quite a few years now. Uh, I'm the author of an online paper called The Origin of Identity Politics and Political Correctness. And what's never discussed, and it's never admitted, even by Brendan here has got quite closest to it, is where the history of this stuff comes from. It's nearly a century ago now when the left intellectuals realised there had to be an explanation why it was in the West. There was no revolution like there was in, in, in Russia. And they blame the workers. They took an idea from Freud about rep repression. The workers are repressed by capitalism. You have to have a replacement for the workers to be the Vanguard Revolution became women. That's the beginning of contemporary feminism. And then in the, in the States, with the civil rights movement and Stonewall in 68 and 69, that's when you got the beginnings of what we now call into politics, when you got the triumvirate of victim classes of women, ethnic minorities, and, and LGBT. Right, that's it's it's a complete crock of shite. It's the biggest political fraud in history, and it completely dominates politics. And the left, including I'm afraid even Brendan here, are still in complete denial about it. It's the biggest thing in politics. We need to discuss it. We need to kill it. Um, I was interested to hear people Thanks. discussing a move back towards more kind of humanistic identities. And I don't know when people talk about humanism and humanistic identities, it strikes me that. For a long time in the past, various groups of people were viewed as less than human because of various identities that they had. And uh, people have talked about the Renaissance man and uh, that being more of an ideal. But the Renaissance man was presumably a white European man. That's what we're talking about there. And I'm curious as to 
uh, perhaps I'm just sort of too young to remember this, but I'm curious as to whether there was some kind of golden age where um, there were humanistic identities that did genuinely encompass <laughs> everyone in society. And if there was one, why is it that it's totally impossible and totally inconceivable that we could continue to have a humanistic identity that also takes account of various differences with people as well as the similarities between them. Hi, I just wanted to ask the panel um, something. So I, I really agree with what was said right at the back that, um, I mean, I'm a teacher and of very young children and um, the first thing that they do is come in and tell me they're either a girl or a boy and if they're a girl, they like pink and purple and if they're a boy, they like blue and, um, and you know, that, that comes directly from them and I just think that that kind of level of identity and a lot of the identity that we're talking about here is about how do I negotiate my life um, as opposed to um, how do I fight a political fight. And I, the, it's made me think that there are identities that sometimes are given to people um, to justify inequality um, in the way that you, you were talking about, um, you know, people having to stand up for um, blacks to have the same equality as whites in America. Um, and, and then there are identities that we have to help us make sense of our lives. Um, but my question is, is it the case, would you say, as a panel, that actually people are quite scared of political identities nowadays? I mean, one of the things we can't talk about in this country at the moment is national identity um, because of the whole Brexit discussion. You know, it's a bad thing to be pro having our country back, taking control and all of those sorts of things. So um, I just yeah. wondered what you all thought on that. I also attended a bunch of the discussions yesterday about mental health um, and, and young people. And I was wondering, you know, kind of mirroring what um, the girl, two people in front of me was saying, um, this kind of humanist identity that we're talking about, I, I do think um, that's at least what I personally am striving toward. Um, but I sometimes feel like the identity politics that we currently discuss is so kind of input focused or, you know, it seems so focused on what other people think about you and what how other people see you and what other people say about you and what other people, you know, do to you, with you, you know, how they integrate you or not, um, instead of being, you know, a discussion about basically, you know, almost more and more egocentric. So what am I doing? What am I saying? What am I, you know, contributing? Where do I see myself in 20 years? Who do I want myself to be, right? So I think there seems to be um, a, a bit of a connection with this maybe authority question that was brought up um, a few minutes ago and, you know, how we kind of negotiate our place in the world and that we've stopped, you know, taking our own agency as the you know, central concept, and instead we've kind of replaced it with, you know, where other people see us and would put us. Very briefly, I totally agree. The question there was, it was said that the identity frames experience, you shouldn't accept it as permanent. And I agree, of course, we don't accept it as permanent. So I just accept that. But there are a few really interesting points here. This, you know, people allude to humanistic aspiration for that kind of, that, the more universal identity, which makes, takes us above this fragmentation. And I think it's, that's not remotely incompatible with the accepting of other Identities, they're kind of nested. So there's, there's a kind of what you might call erasing universalism, which says that, you know, we have to kind of accept we're all the family of, of humankind. And that means all these other little identities you have, forget about them. They're, they're not real, they exist. But the alternative is to say, no, we have this shared... You know, we ought to build on this shared understanding, the shared human endeavour. But that's not to deny those other things. So the British Humanist Association, for example, you know, it has subgroups of people with special interests, of regions. They have a gay and lesbian group, things like that. In no way does that not make people full members of the whole group. So, you know, it, it's, it, you, you, can, you can have both the universalist aspiration and a recognition of the importance. Things are nested in that way. But there's one point that has come up I'm not quite sure where it came from, but a few things made me think about this. I was a bit worried that, you know, we're kind of saying, oh, all this obsession with identity politics and people saying, you can't talk this, blah, blah, blah. I suppose I'm not really sure whether that's true. We hear the stories of these things. We hear about the very vocal people on campuses who talk about this. But I'm not sure whether the majority of people are really wedded to this extreme identity politics. So, so why do we hear a lot of it? And uh, this is just a thought. I might be wrong about this, but... I, wondered, I, th I think sometimes what happens is that the more fundamental thing that's changing in society is this kind of citizen as consumer kind of attitude whereby we're demanding of the governments and of the authorities, whatever, what we want for ourselves and we believe we have a right to that. And I actually think a lot of the time the appeals to identity 
It's just a means to that end, actually. People want something from the state as a consumer, and they, 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 they latch onto the identity which gives them the legitimization to demand it. So, you know, you must give this to me because I'm a, I am, you know, one of these people, I'm, I'm a whatever it is, I'm, I'm a cancer victim or whatever it might be, and, and we, ha we have this special interest group, the identity, and you need to recognize our interests, blah, blah, blah. But I think perhaps the deeper problem is that that's just the, the tool people use, just because going back to this idea of negotiation is a word that's been used a lot, and I completely agree with this, you know. Society is about negotiating with each other, and that means not having the boundaries. And I think that rather than sort of accept there's lots of messy negotiation and, and compromise, people will sort of like find ways to demand what they want by finding the identity that will give it to them. I suppose there never was a golden age, except maybe in the late 60s. Uh, not, 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 in terms of, not in terms of achievement, but in terms of hope. I mean, what, what strikes me now is, is it's the absence of hope in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a coherent future. That's the, the distressing thing about the current political scene. Um, somebody else made a point about um, uh, the, the, the difficulty we have in, divining, um, in defining our individualism. And it's a curious thing. We, uh, you know, it's normally our, our identity, both in ourselves and in our group, is, is really constituted by its public recognition. And, the, and yet there's a curious movement in, in the more extreme advocates of identity politics, which says, and in the same breath, recognize me, but then if that recognition takes the form of, if it's even tinged with a hint of criticism, uh, or even constructive comment, it's, I don't recognize you. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, it's a both an invitation of, of that social recognition which would make it real. I mean, that's, a, that's how any of us become real, because the world recognizes us. Um, and then the moment that the, the world accepts that invitation, it's no, because you're, you're, not, you're, you're, not, you're not taking me on the terms that I've already laid down, which is a disaster, because uh, so, as many people have said, that it, it cuts, it, it closes down at the outset the possibility of negotiation. The, I mean, the very phrase identity politics, I struggled with it. I thought, what is this? Does, isn't, isn't this phrase a kind of oxymoron? You know, because the whole point, um, it, 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 politics is negotiation. Identity says, don't. I, I, take me as I am. So what I want to say is I would caution, at least from my own point of view, about thinking that the universal is necessarily better than the particular. We want a world where we can take seriously the thinness of being human, but the thickness of being interesting people who bring different kinds of traits and different cultural achievements uh, into the social uh, realm where we can decide which ones we want to um, celebrate and value and take on. So I, the idea of a thick and thin, a balance between them, I think really that's the challenge. What Maybe now too much is riding on taking the thick part of what it is to be human seriously, and that's where identity politics has gone wrong. But I don't think that the solution is to say we should only be concerned about the thinness that what it is to be human is to both be able to, sell, to, to be a citizen and to celebrate the universal, but also to be richly and thickly textured. I don't want to give that up. And I will tell you, this I will say, I had other things to say too, but I think one interesting thing, I'm somebody who has spent a lot of time in my own work insisting, like many other people, that race is a social contract, construct just as much as class is. And when I say that, I've had black colleagues in America tell me that I'm engaging in ethnic cleansing. You're getting rid of, you're facing what it is to be black. And you know, I understand that class looks like it's so different from race, but there are many contexts in which they both are social categories. People are in positions where they have to choose. And in the US, the, the, the policy with regard to which you were supposed to choose was so odd initially in the late 19th and early 20th century, the so-called one drop rule. So it's important to know that Homer Plessy, in that famous Plessy versus Ferguson case in New Orleans, the railway segregation case, Homer Plessy didn't look, Homer Plessy was not in any way a brown skinned person. Let's just put it that way. You wouldn't necessarily have even known he was black, but he had one drop. And so race is as complicated a category as class is. Um, and I, I would caution the idea that somehow race is new or that race is about being individual, or that it's so different from thinking about class. To my mind, they're both, as comp they're both complicated concepts, and the ideal would be to find a thickness about being human that didn't look at class or at race.
I think, I think a lot of people feel there is a cartoon caricature of identity politics that is... Um, the, the, you know, just offers people victimhood, competing grievances is not very helpful. I'm not sure if we totally pin down if we think that is silly or if we think it's dangerous, because the extent that most people think it's very silly, it's not very dangerous, actually. And the, the reason I wouldn't panic too much about it is to the extent that, you know, one occasionally reads in the newspapers of absolutely daft things happening on campuses. The campus culture wars, if they're happening a lot, and, you know, might be a bit dangerous if they are, um, they're not, that discussion isn't happening off campus. If you go into the town centre and go into a coffee shop and see if people are riven by these debates about, um, you know, identities or no one can say anything, they're, they're not. So we shouldn't get into, well, you Claire, what you'd call a moral panic um, about, about it if, if it's not happening. But if it incentivises people to always go for a smaller group, you know, until we get to the Anglo-Indian-Irish mixed-race group that, you know, finally get a seat at the table, then um, let's not do that. Let's go, for the broader, let's go for the broader solidarities. But the other reason not to worry, in my view, too much, is that the nation is not terribly unfashionable. Um, 75 or 80% of people in this country have quite a strong sense of national identity and 10 or 15% of people think let's move beyond that and I would be very very surprised if there's a major democracy where that isn't the case so what's really interesting are what are the terms of that national identity how inclusive, when we ask I think a very good question, how do people become us, if you come to this country how do your kids get to be just as British as me and my kids how do we make that quite an inclusive thing that works for everybody, not a fearful thing. And this is the thing that identity politics got wrong, I think. I think identity politics was right that identity was quite mat mattered quite a lot to the minority groups that hadn't had a voice, or the majority group, women who hadn't had a voice, actually. But it forgot, it took for granted that the majority had any identity needs, and actually the majority had important reasons to want to see its identity reflected, and national identity can do both. Uh, you know, as a majority, racial identity won't be very helpful. So the humanist vision, I agree with you, I think, is too arid. You know, you build your solidarities up. No one's ever felt cosmopolitan if they didn't think their passport would, you know, guarantee their sort of rights to live. And if you were in a place where that didn't happen, you know, it all goes wrong. So I think, I think national identity, you build out from it. You build out from local identity. You build out from group identities to humanity. Uh, Brandon, uh, yeah. On the question of is there anything wrong with inventing and reinventing your identity, it's a bit tragic. It always reminds me of what Julie Birchall said about Madonna. If she was any good, she wouldn't have to keep reinventing herself. And that's how I feel about this constant <laughs> reinvention. But there is a contradiction in relation to identity at the moment, which is that on the one hand, it's very fluid and volatile and unstable, but on the other hand, it's quite rigid and it's always seeking to be firmed up with medical authority or government approval and so on. So it, it's actually very illiberal because it locks the person into a kind of, they almost become psychic slaves where they're constantly needing the validation of officialdom in particular. Uh, and I think that give, makes for a very unpleasant experience, no doubt. On the Renaissance man and humanist politics, humanist politics is getting a bad rap on this panel. Uh, the idea that it's arid is, strikes me as uh, very unusual. Um, my view is that the, the humanist politics, in its best sense, was a struggle against the separation of man into different racial, biological, sexual, man and woman, into various different categories, which we were told defined them, uh, influenced them, made them capable of certain things and incapable of other things. Humanist politics was a struggle against that. Identity politics is an accommodation to it. It refashions that, those old divisions, those ethnic, communal, racial divisions, as something progressive, as something worth celebrating, as something worth clinging onto. That is the difference. Humanist politics wanted to get rid of it. Identity politics builds it back up. Final point, uh, I'm not worried about tension or divisions in society at all. I think they're a very good thing. I would prefer that they were not ethnic tensions or communal tensions, which is what identity politics gives rise to, but rather political and social tensions which is why I think someone asked about Brexit. Brexit, to my mind, is the best thing that has happened in British politics in a generation. I, it's the first thing in my lifetime I'd go to the barricades for. I'd burn down the House of Commons for Brexit. Brexit is the greatest thing because, I'll tell you why, because Brexit exposed that there are class, geographical, social tensions in this country. And that is a good thing and we ought to talk about them but instead of course everyone who voted Brexit has been demonised as a racist and a xenophobe and low information <laughs> i.e. stupid because uh, the establishment cannot handle the reality that is potentially revealed by Brexit. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, I just wondered what the panel thought about the idea that actually uh, with the rise of 
identity politics and the problems it's prevalent, it's, is it that it's been the death of political solidarity? So actually, the idea that I don't have to have felt the sting of racial abuse or have had to experience homophobia to stand in solidarity with somebody who's fighting for gay rights or racial equality. And it plays out in this kind of way, and I'm glad that um, the topic of working class culture has been raised, because now we have people on the left arguing that we must sympathise with, uh, with working class boys or with the working class left wingers coming out in sympathy, rather than standing in political solidarity. And so this is the kind of rise of identity politics and a validation of you wouldn't understand because you haven't had my lived experience, uh, kind of spoken to the death of the idea that of a trust in political solidarity and a trust that someone stands for what you want, not for what you are. I'd like to ask a question of, uh, about financial incentives for choosing identity. I had an American student staying with me this summer and she had, cho she had multiple options of race open to her because of her background and she had chosen the race that gave her financial incentives for college. She was annoyed because the country she came from had been recategorized and it would have given her greater incentives if she'd chosen a different race. <laughs> so um, her race, racial choice was entirely to do with financial incentives. Um, what do the panel think about that? I think it was Brendan who mentioned the, the genders and the huge, like the aero gender and stuff. And obviously that does sound ridiculous when you think about it. But I, instead of framing it as just like the collapse of institutions and like the world's gone to shit, it seems to me more like the true like individualization of culture in the good way, in that we can all express who we are in the sense that, because if I look around, I see... Uh, women in dresses, but I don't see any men in dresses that I can see. Sorry if I'm missing you. But, <laughs> um, and I think it's really, um, because we seem to desire categories for who we are, we can't just be a man in a dress. Um, and, and, but we have to kind of categorise that as, oh, as therefore I am, I'm a woman today. But you shouldn't, because society can't quite handle the fact that I'm sexually male, but I just happen to be wearing whatever I can, these, like, we've all made it a bit silly, perhaps, trying to explain who we are, but eventually this will lead to just, I'm me, which is obviously the best end goal, when we can all be who we are and we won't have to categorise ourselves. Identity politics uh, suits the white slave owner perfectly, I think. Um, it uh, is basically saying that, well, they're different to us, uh, so we treat them differently. The demand, and I think you're reading history backwards in many ways and putting identity politics where it isn't, uh, the demand from uh, slaves in the uh, 19th century was to be treated the same, was to be treated as human beings, uh, not to be treated as separate, not to be treated as differently. And there's always a point in the discussion, particularly with people who are very uh, firm about identi their identities, where they'll say, well, of course, you, ultimately you don't understand because you haven't, you're not a woman or because you're not black. You won't understand this because you haven't had this experience. Um, and whenever that happens, I always turn to the, uh, the classical playwright Terence and say nothing that is human is alien to me. Uh, Julian uh, and Sunder, um, uh, I'm really concerned that you sort of imagine that the conversations about identity politics are just uh, either philosophical or to do with being on a university sort of campus. I think it's beyond that. And the reason I, I think it's beyond that is that it's codified often in equal opportunity policies that prop up all the institutions around us, even within the voluntary sector, even within corporate sort of business. And the corrosive element of identity politics and how equal opportunity categories have expanded over the past sort of 20 years with all the identities and, uh, uh, that they're specified uh, is that it's also codified in policy. So we've seen an acceleration of people making bullying and harassment claims in the workplace based on this. And based on that, people are saying that I'm victimised <laughs> because of a, my perception of what you're doing to me as a colleague. And, and that is beyond the walls of uh, academia. And um, I think it's an important sort of um, and serious sort of issue. Can I just make a defence of universalism? Because I think quite a few people in the panel have talked about it, Michelle in particular, as if it's just uh, another identity category. Whereas my understanding of universalism was that you assumed that you had politically different individual 
entities. That's the point about it. If we were all the same, then we wouldn't need politics and we wouldn't need uh, individuals discussing politics in the public realm. So I think it's important that we recognize that universalism does not mean that we're all the same. It means that we're politically different individuals who exist in the public realm and make politics through it. And a very short question for Michelle. In the 1970s, I've been reading about the Earth Day and what people say is that the American middle class breathed a sigh of relief in 1970 when Earth Day uh, was announced because it meant that they didn't need to refer to class anymore in terms of political discussion. There was a new outlook that meant that it was a moment in which class wasn't the way in which you looked at the world. I accept what you're saying about American different, that it didn't have class politics, but class did form the way in which people understood the world, and it's the rejection of that that took place uh, in the early 70s. The gentleman who was talking about what's wrong with kind of assuming different identities all the time, there's, isn't it a harmless thing? You know, you can't just say you get one shot at life. I think that, that that's what's really fascinating, because for me, that's what identity politics has done. It's a challenge to what actually Ivan said, which is about agency, which is... Agency is, is that you don't get one shot at life. You can make yourself through ideas, through acting on the world, and so on. Not by changing your identity every five minutes, but by actually becoming a new person. And one of the problems about a lot of identity politics is it's ghettoizing. So, you know, it's, I would say do something that makes you interesting rather than just changing your identity hat. The, the other thing that I, I thought about universalism, just to say on that, was, the, again, actually, what Ivan said about the open door. Um, it, it's open to everyone and anyone, and that seems to me to be about universalism. So I, I, I mentioned this when I was talking to Camille yesterday, but there's been a campaign amongst school pupils against the music A-level um, on the basis that it didn't have uh, enough or any female composers on for study. And this went on and on. And the young women who got the backing of the government and all of the members of the establishment basically seemed to me to be indifferent about the composers that were on it and the classical music that was on it. They just wanted women composers on it. So they consider it's now a great victory that Kate Bush is on the music A-level <laughs> curriculum. I.e., they didn't care what woman... They just wanted a woman or women, right? Which seems to me to be insulting as a woman and misses the point about classical music, which is open to everyone and anyone. The fact that in a particular politi political and historic time there weren't very many women composers is not classical music's fault or issue. It can't be compensated by, by throwing a few women at it who are no good. <laughs> if you see what I mean. And then, and then my... <laughs> My final point is just, I, I think that to say that this is confined to university campuses does underestimate it. It is a constant feature of this festival itself. Never mind anything else. You know, people keep saying to me, why have you not got representatives of this on panels? I mean, this goes on all the bloody time. Drives me mad. And, uh, and I'll sort of say, well, we've also got a very mixed panel. Uh, you know, you can never say, I mean, you're ticking boxes constantly. <laughs> young people in particular have now decided that as a young person, this has become a category, right? You're not listening to me and I'm a young person. Well, you're not saying anything interesting. <laughs> I'm not going to listen to you. <laughs> what does it mean? It's a mad thing, right? So I, I don't mind you saying something. I don't care who you are if you say it. I want to be indifferent to your age, your gender, your colour. I want to know if you're interesting. That's all that I care about. <laughs> but that is not what society cares about at all. Not a chance. So I think it's the dominant corrosive influence of our time. Anyway, <laughs> I had to get that out of my system. <laughs> now the panel... Now the panel can sum up. Now the panel can sum up in reverse order. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's time to fess up, I suppose, as, as it's the end. The, the reason I'm, I'm kind of been struck a slightly sceptical note, of course, is envy. You know, I, I have identity envy. I'm sure it's, some, it's a new pathology. Because um, I don't have one. You know, I haven't got an identity. What am I? You know, I'm white middle class. I like classical music. It's, de it's kind of identity death, isn't it? <laughs> um, if, if the new politics, if the new identity politics were to be instantiated, God help us, you know, imagine, um, I, I wouldn't exist. I'd be erased, you know. So that, that's the first thing. Second, just to, just to come back to Michelle's point about the thick, I may have misunderstood this, but the thick and thin identity. 
Uh, one blessing about the old liberal dispens politics dispensation, no matter what its fault is, is that it knew that when you, left the, when you left the meeting room and went home, you were leaving the political arena. Thank goodness. You, you could go home and sort of take, take your, put your feet up and, and, just, and just be personal. And, and I think that terrible, one of the things about the, this, um, the, the new space being opened up by this discourse is that it, 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 it wants to... Uh, it, uh, kind of have the political bacillus infect every part of life, so that so that uh, every 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 stray part of our identity, whether we are born in Yorkshire or Lancashire, becomes something we have to fight about in the political arena. Let's let's um, hang on to the notion that some bits of our identity, however comforting and, and valuable they are to ourselves, uh, should be kept in the private sphere. Okay, thank you very much, um, Brendan. Um, yeah, on the question of, you know, isn't this just kind of individualism taken to its logic conclusion, this is not individualism, what we're talking about now. Individualism in its traditional sense, if you go back to John Stuart Mill, the idea of individualism was the strong, free-willed, capable individual who could, who could understand the world around him, on, him or her and could engage with it as a reasoned creature. That's what individualism was. This is the complete opposite of that. This signals actually the death of individualism because this is about identities that are fragile, where it's assumed you can't hear certain ideas or engage with certain ideas without having a nervous breakdown, where you're constantly seeking the validation of everyone around you because you're so needy. That is not individualism. That is the crisis of individualism personified. And I think the, the, the important thing about individualism in the past, the idea of the free-willed individual, all of whom had a shared capacity to reason and engagement, was that that fueled humanism, that fueled the universal idea. People often think there's a contradiction between individualism and universalism, but actually they, they feed into each other extremely well. The problem with the politics of identity is that it utterly undermines both. It undermines individualism by creating a sense of the fragile self who constantly needs therapeutic scaffolding all around him, and it undermines universalism by putting us all into these tiny little boxes. That's why we should reject the politics of identity. It undermines those two great creeds of progressive modern politics. So I started by rejecting that politics of identity, but I will conclude by affirming the value of identity politics that's really politics. I'll start with a quick quote from James Baldwin, an interview in Life magazine, 1963. Quote, you think your pain and heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world. But then you read, it was Dostoevsky and Dickens who taught me that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive or who had ever been alive, end quote. And why Baldwin? Because he could take that sense of the transformative power of literature in particular to help him understand how his pain connected him to others, and yet he never denied, like the woman who says in the employment, in the place of employment, that sexual harassment means something to me that men had not for decades, centuries understood, that the black experience of being the object of racial stigma and racial discrimination that produced inequality needed to be aired in a way that it wasn't being aired in a world that didn't take that experience seriously. That's how you combine the universal and the particular. It isn't by denying that the particular matters. I think a lot of good points have been made about solidarity and against ticking boxes, and that's right, but I just want to dig a little bit into that. I think, I think it's good in this country. We actually passed pioneering race relations, anti-discrimination legislation in the late 60s, in the, in the early 70s, in parliaments that were all white. Uh, and had very few women in them. And it's, you know, it shows it's not impossible to do that. But it would be odd having passed that legislation if you kept being colourblind, but your, par your colourblind parliament was entirely white. Not because you need a microcosm of your society with the exact number of every group and the exact number of women, but if you're right that you're being colourblind and genderblind and that if talent and opportunity ambition happen to be equally distributed, then you're actually getting it wrong with your gender-blind and colour-blind approach if, 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 if diversity doesn't turn up. And then you can be relaxedly, I think, colour-blind and gender-blind once the group that's saying that is mixed. 
and has women in it being gender blind. And it's a, there's a difficulty, I think, with the people who are forced to be the pioneers, get all the burden of representation put on them. And the answer is to, to broaden it out. So this is also, I think, though, a serious issue. It isn't just about seniors and campuses. And, you know, the thing that went wrong uh, very badly, as an example of something that does go wrong, we didn't pl police sexual abuse in Rotherham properly, partly because girls of a particular class background weren't valued, and partly because the council wasn't really sure what you should do with the law if it happened to be Asian men who were doing it. And that is utterly bonkers, and how you get to a position you were doing it. But it's quite interesting, actually, and again, the value of diversity and not being played by stupid claims. An Asian prosecutor got in and actually said, what on earth are we doing? Enforce the law, treat people equally. It is offensive. Not to, not to enforce the law, to somehow have a set of other expectations. So actually, I think one of the values of a more diverse norm is you stop getting played by daft, silly and polarising claims that shouldn't be upheld. Thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd like to reinforce the last points made by Michelle and Sundar. I think they're, they're spot on. I think, you know, we, if we want to live together with our differences. We need to live together you know, with those differences, and you have to recognise those differences if you're going to do that. Now, I think here's a little game you can play, though, later, and you can do it retrospectively as well. Uh, over the course of today, you'll probably hear lots of people talking about crises of or deaths of, right? Every time you hear that, take a deep breath, count to three, and replace that phrase with some problems with. <laughs> and, and actually, you'll get things in perspective and you'll see things. So, does identity politics, for example, mean the death of politi political solidarity? No. But identity politics has created some problems with solidarity. But, I, you know, we mustn't think that the, uh, it's the enemy of solidarity. And, in fact, I think that one, some evidence that this is, in fact, the case is I think we live in, I'm going to call it a Spartacus society. Whenever uh, things go wrong, people stand up and they say, like, je suis Charlie, or whatever it is, you know. People will stand up and say that they make the identification with the other that has suffered, and that is a mainstream political thing we do. That is a good example of how you can have solidarity which recognises that there are never less differences and groups and some people who are having a tougher time than others. So they're not the enemy. This only it only becomes a problem if the identity politics becomes so rigid that it closes off that greater solidarity, but it doesn't have to at all. Thank you.